I have loved singing that song ever since my voice changed when I was 14. It has been a huge blessing to me for a long, long time. Uh, I failed to mention to you that uh, if you are in Jonathan Strasser's class, which typically meets in the gym, today they will be meeting upstairs in the room next to the elevator, room 201. So please make a note of that. Uh, I want to say happy Father's Day uh, to our dads out there. And um, thank you for what you do. Thank you for who you are. Uh, our shepherds have a gift for you today uh, as you leave service. This is a little devotional book by Tony Dungy. Uh, it's called Playbook for an Uncommon Life. Uh, Tony, the uh, longtime football coach that uh, uh, is a Christian and, and just wanted to gift you with that today, Dad. So on your way out, find one of the shepherds in the foyer and they will uh, give you a free copy of that book. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be opening to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, I think it's on page 855, if you'll turn there as we jump into the Word of God today. Uh, you know, James kind of gets to this section where we're at today, and he, he asks this interesting question, at least a, a question that I find interesting. He asks this question, uh, who, is, who is wise and understanding among you? And uh, I just want you to pause for a moment and think about that in your own life, in your own context. Who would you say is the wisest person you know? Uh, just get that image of that person, and it can't be yourself, but think, of, think about that, that, that person that you would say is the wisest person that you know. Now, it's interesting if you try to go on and if you try to, like, Google who's the wisest person on earth and all that kind of you know, a lot, of, a lot of things will come back to say, you know, the, the, these lists of the top 10 or top 20 or top whatever smartest people in the world. And um, I don't know why, but a lot of these lists that I looked at, it's like, you know, if you're like a great chess player, you're like, you know, you're like the smartest person in the world. I mean, that's what a lot of these, these lists uh, had on them. But, but James is talking about a little, a little something different here. And I think this is a, a very timely message for us as a church in, in lieu of recent events. And, and James really begins to address this idea of, of these competing wisdoms that we face in our life. Uh, that there's, there's these philosophies that are going around our land today uh, that are in direct opposition and direct competition with, with what God would deem as being wise or, or being of him. And these philosophies are, are, not, are not getting any easier to, to deal with and not getting any easier to, to handle and, and think through. And so I want us to read uh, this section today and begin thinking through and, and reflecting on God's wisdom for us today. I believe God has a word for you today, and so I want to encourage you to tune in. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not, listen, I want, such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and he uses this big word, demonic. Such wisdom is demonic, James says. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all, get this list, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. And then he closes this part with, in verse 18. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James says, who is wise and understanding among you? I love the quote from uh, Socrates who says, I am the wisest man alive, for I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. <laughs> Anybody, anybody can identify with that? Here's what James says. He, says. he says, wisdom is not necessarily the smartest person in the room. Wisdom 
is not necessarily the, the, the preacher who goes to the most seminaries. It's not necessarily the, the person who has the most degrees. But what does James say? He says that let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And this, we, we, we hear these echoes of, of these words of James that he would tell us a chapter earlier. He would say, show me your, your faith without your deeds. And James is, is constantly kind of moving us to that place. You know, not that we're, not that we're, we're shown favor by God because, or, or not that we're, you know, in right relationship with God because of our deeds. But he says, he says if, if you want to know full wisdom, if you want to know what wisdom really looks like, it's not necessarily what you say. It, it moves to that place of deeds. And maybe, maybe, maybe you're in that place this morning. I, I believe in God, but I, I haven't necessarily let God begin to fully do his work inside of me in a way in which that plays out in my everyday life. That we have erroneously believed maybe in the church or in our culture today that if I if maybe I can just believe it but I don't necessarily have to to live it the other six days of the week and James begins addressing this head on and we ask that question how can I be a person that who shows up and and sings the songs and sits in the pews but I I, I don't live it out well he addresses that in the next verse verse 14 but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts I want you to catch that because because James has been saying this kind of the whole the whole letter that he's been writing he's saying it's not really a head issue it's it's more of a of a heart issue and, and you hear him again, echoing his half-brother Jesus time and time again. And, and, he, and he does this because Jesus will, will often move to that place of the heart. You know, he, he'll say, you know, you, you, you may ha- you, you, you've heard it said, don't murder. You've heard that said before. I, I tell you, Jesus says, that it, if, if you hate somebody, if you hate them, You've already committed that heinous act in your heart. Most of us were horrified to hear about what ha- happened in Charleston this past week. Jesus says that, that if you hate somebody, that, that you've already committed that act in your, in your heart. Now, now we, we realize that the, the earthly consequences of, of murder and, and, and hate, you know, don't shape up this. But, but what Jesus is saying, look, it's a heart issue. It's not necessarily a head issue, it's a, it's a heart issue which will change your head. So you may believe God in the head, but it hasn't started to work itself into the heart. He says, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Don't say you know a, a lot about the Bible or you, you claim to be wise and claim to be a Christian, but you don't, you don't live that out the other six days of the week. He goes on in verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's, it's earthly it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. And next week in, in James chapter 4, he's, he's going to give us an, an illustration of how this earthly wisdom thing begins to play out. Uh, but for today, he goes on and talks about this addressing of the people of the day in which he is writing to. And I want you to just think about this with me. Why would James be addressing this? And why is this relevant for us today? Why is this something that we need to, to really take a, a, a moment to look at and, and let it penetrate our own hearts? And I want you to think about the context of the early church. I want you to think about the, the unleashing of God's spirit among his people in the early, early church, Acts 1-8, you know, that you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you're going to be my witnesses in these various places. And you, you begin to think about this unleashing of God's spirit and what's, what happens when God's spirit is unleashed in the, in the people of God. They begin to have these, these spiritual experiences, these, these, ex, these experiences where they actually experience the power of God. And, and some of us, you know, you've, you've had, and I'm not talking necessarily about some overtly supernatural experience. I'm talking about that we, we sense God's spirit and presence in us 
from time to time. Anybody ever sense God's presence? And you can't necessarily articulate it. You can't ne- necessarily put words around it. But you've sensed God's power, God's presence within you. And so this is, this is happening in the early church. Could it be possible that as this is happening in the early church, that they are beginning to, they are beginning to not necessarily look at the source of the power and where the power is coming from, they are beginning to, to think of themselves as, as more wise. They are beginning to think of themselves as, as the ones who are, are actually uh, perpetuating this, this power in their own lives. Could that be possible? Does that infiltrate itself into the church? Does that philosophy come into the church even today that we think more highly of ourselves than we think of the God in whom equips us with his spirit because the fact is that that God visits us with his power and that is a testament to to his goodness not ours if you agree with me say amen (laughs) you got one Um, and I want you to track with me here for just a moment because wisdom is ultimately begins to be on display in the way that you live not by what you say you can be informed you can be knowledgeable you can be smart and yet be very foolish because wisdom is more about how you live and what that life produces James is saying now we we just kind of put on the brakes here say whoa whoa James are you saying that I can be smart I can do the church thing that I can I can I can do all that and, and and that be classified as demonic Well, look what he says. He goes on to say in verse 16, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. I love this because James is saying, you know, I I don't have to prove it to you. I'm not going to write this big exposition paper on having to prove to you. Your life is going to prove it. It's uh, going to be marked by disorder. And every evil practice, it's going to prove itself. If bitter envy and selfish ambition is is the the context of your life, that's going to play out. Things are going to play out. And here's here's my desire for it. I I am so honored to be able to to get up and and proclaim the Word of God to you each and every week. It, it It is a privilege of mine. And here's my desire. I, I, don't, I just don't want that to play out in your life or mine. This idea of bitter envy and selfish ambition. And I want you to just stop for a moment and just, just think about your own life. Because where does this most often play out in your own life? And most often will play out in our relationships, doesn't it? I mean, dads. Think about, think about in the context of your home. Moms, think about in the context of your home. Single adults, senior adults, think about the context. These relationships that we have is most often where this bitter envy and this selfish ambition raise its ugly head. And so when we examine our own lives and we think about our own context, well, what, what, does, that, what does that say to me? Well, I mean, what, what does that begin to mean for for me in my own life, I heard the story of these three guys who decided to go to a conference, and the, the conference was um, entitled, How to Get Your Wife to Line Up. <laughs> Should I go here? Mm. Nope. So the conference was how to get your wife to line up. So they go to the conference, and, and uh, they, they decide to get together a couple weeks later and discuss what they've learned. And so the first guy, uh, the first guy comes in and he says, you know what, I, you know, I, the, I, I learned some stuff at the conference. I went back home. I couldn't, I couldn't see any change on the, on the first day. I couldn't see anything on the second day. But on the third day, you know, things actually started changing. And, and the second guy said the same thing. He said the first day, you know, I, I couldn't see anything. Second day, I couldn't see anything. But on the third day, things actually started changing a little bit. And the third guy piped up and said, well, on the first day, I couldn't see anything. On the second day, I couldn't see anything. But on the third day, I could see just a little bit out of my left eye. Just a little bit. That's funny. I don't care who you are. But this is what our homes can look like. 
right? There's screaming and yelling and fussing, and it's not working out. And there's this disorder that comes from every evil practice. Now, I want you to listen, because we're all in the same hospital here, okay? But as a church, that's got to change. It's got to change. Because those things may creep in from time to time, but we need to pursue a greater wisdom. A wisdom that comes from heaven. Look what James says in verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, he, he lists these characteristics, is first of all pure. Then peace loving. It's considerate. Submissive. Full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere now i just want to ask you would you rather have a verse 16 neighbor or would you rather have a verse 17 neighbor verse 16 envy and selfish ambition verse 17 peace loving and considerate would you rather have a verse 16 neighbor or would you rather have a verse 17 neighbor? I think the question kind of answers itself, but the harder question is what is it going to take for you to become the verse 17 neighbor? What's it going to take for you? I mean, I was, sitting this, I was sitting there reading these verses this week and I'll, the only song that popped in my head was, you know, I am 16 going on 70. Yeah. So, I mean, when we're just, we're with this, I mean, uh, crazy stuff happens when the Spirit's involved. But it, when, when it just, uh, you know, we need to be that people that go from that verse 16 to that verse 17 people. We need to be that neighbor, don't we? But, but that's, not, that's not something that we just muster up by our own strength. That's not something that we can just get on our own. That's something that comes from God and His wisdom. And so I'm going to give you a few things here in a moment. But as we read verse 18, this last part, that peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That literally means they reap the fruit of righteousness. That, that, that there's this peace that genuine wisdom can bring to our homes and to our community. And I want to ask you this question. Are you motivated by self-centered ambition or are you motivated by God-centered humility? I want you to wrestle with that question. It's one that I've, I've wrestled with all week. Because I see this philosophy in our land today that, that says that if we will be motivated by self-centered ambition. Now get this, because this is, a, this is a premier philosophy in our day and age today. If you'll, be motiv if you'll look out for number one, if you'll be motivated by selfish ambition, then you will be successful. Then you will get to where you want to go. And then you will be on that pedestal that you want to be at right and this is a philosophy that we're being that is being i mean it's the it's the me me it, it is just there and, and we even hear about it individually we think about that in our own context and the selfish ambition that we have and it, it doesn't mean that we don't take care of ourselves and we don't do it that, that's not what it's talking about but when but when everything that we do is is centered upon how it how does this affect me how how, how does this affect my generation I mean, we're a five-generation church, folks. I want you to look around. There are five generations represented in this room. Now, if every one of us say, I want to focus on my generation. I want to focus on my generation. Very rarely do I have somebody come up to me and say, you know what, preacher, how, how, can, how can we bless another generation? How can we bless the generation that's older than us? How can we bless them? How can we bless the generation that's coming behind us? But we, we see what James begins to talk about and why he begins to address this in his letter. So I want to I give you three things that you can put to the test this week. And I, I dare you to try these. I dare you to try these things this week. And see if you don't reap a harvest. Number one is this. Write it down. It's, that you, you pray for wisdom. I mean, we're going back here to James chapter 1 where he said, If any one of you lacks wisdom, he should do what? Ask God. Ask God. Pray for wisdom. 
I challenge you to pray for wisdom this week. Ask God for it. There's this wisdom that cannot be found in intellectual knowledge and practical experience. This is a wisdom that can only be found on your face before God. It's his wisdom. And it's totally different than the way we typically think. And you cannot manufacture this wisdom. I was struck yesterday as we gathered in this room and memorialized Ashton Kelly, who was the young man that passed away recently. And uh, he was uh, um, in the Navy, and, and there was several of uh, servicemen and women here uh, yesterday. And, and the guy who got up that was his Navy captain, uh, he, he, called, he, he called all of those who had served to attention. And they all stood up. Every one of them stood up. And I thought, what, what a unique picture that was. And so, I, I, you know, it just hit me yesterday. I thought, you know, man, I, I want to I bless the dads but I, today, but I also want to call you dads to attention. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if, if you're a dad, if you'll just stand up right now. And, and I want to read a verse to you from 1 Corinthians 16. Now, we know that we're all one in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. We, we all realize that. But God has placed a, a calling in your life and in my life as well. And in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says these words. He says, be watchful. He says, stand firm in the faith. He says, be strong. He says, act like men. And he says, do everything that you do in love. So I just want to call you men with me to, to repeat after me with those words. I will be watchful. I will stand firm in the faith. I will be strong. I will act like a man. I will do everything that I do in love. And the church said, amen. You may be seated. Now, it's one thing for us to say those words. It's a totally different thing for us to live out what James is saying. That true wisdom is actually living those words out. It's actually applying those words into the context of our homes and what we do. These Three things. Number two, show by doing. Show by doing. James tells us that right at the start of this passage. Show by doing. The antithesis of wisdom is pride, which breeds obsessive self-focus and self-promotion, and it excludes others. But what would it look like this week if that you showed the wisdom of God by doing everything that you do in humility? I'm talking to men and women all over this room right now. Show by doing. And number three is sow in peace. I love those two words, show and sow, show and sow. Sow in peace. James, James says that, that, that peacemakers are going to sow in peace and they're going to reap this harvest of righteousness. Uh, two years ago, uh, I, I met a guy who's come to, to be a friend of mine that we Stay in touch on social media, but his name is Joel Mullen. And you'll see Joel on the far left here of the, the picture. You'll see me on the, on the third to the right there with uh, Matt Miller and Murphy Croson, who are missionaries in Rwanda. And uh, we, had a, we had a group that went to the Philippines a couple years ago, and I got to know Joel there on the far left. And uh, Joel um, just had a unique, unique expression of the way that he uh, constantly was, was reflecting God in his life. And uh, he has, he has uh, adopted two, two young children, and um, he made a video about that just uh, a few weeks ago. And I asked Joel's permission if, if I could share this with you today, and uh, he graciously said that would be great. And so uh, we're going to roll this video that Joel made of his two kids. Hey, 
replaceable. You can say that again. Yeah, he's irreplaceable. <laughs> <laughs> our story is not a secret. We were just little tiny babies. We didn't have a father. We were fatherless. I don't really remember it very much. Me either. We were pretty young. But we were adopted into a loving family. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful that you invited us into your presence today. God, we pray that we will be a people who show by doing the wisdom that you have given us today. We pray that we'll be a people that, that sow in peace and we pray that we will reap that harvest of righteousness that only comes from you. God, I pray today that you will not let these words fall on deaf ears, but that you will allow these words to penetrate our hearts and change our lives, that we may go out of these doors and not be the same because of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you want to pray for wisdom today and you want to meet one of our shepherds, they'll be right back here in the chapel today. Uh, there'll also be a shepherd down front if you want to respond this morning. If you want to give your life to Jesus, to be baptized into him just like G was last week, uh, we would welcome that and celebrate that with you. Now let's come as we stand and sing this song. Oh God.